Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have the complete delight of speaking with Michelle Bowens this evening. And I had so much fun speaking with him at VoiceCraft with Forrest Landry and Tim Adlin when we spoke about value in the comments. And I, Mr. Mr. Bowens is a remarkably hard worker. He has a fantastic database talking about peer-to-peer uh, and the foundation and the work that he does. And one of the pages that I found really engaging was on the foundations uh, of peer-to-peer -peer and the different texts and the different thinkers that are behind his work. And we wanted to have a conversation about those foundational uh, texts, a continual conversation. And I, I have to owe this man, I, I owe this man a lot already because I had no idea about this book, The Structure of World History by Karatani. And I have found it absolutely remarkable. And this was one of the texts that Mr. Bowens um, uh, includes on that foundations uh, page. But before I start, Mr. Bowens, who are you? What work do you do? What is peer-to-peer? Uh, -peer? And uh, what, what inspires you to, to focus on that work? Well, uh, that could take a whole program. So I'll, I'll just be <laughs> short about it. Uh, so I, I do think it's important, you know, where we are. So I am a Belgian. So, you know, steeped in European culture and, and Belgium is interesting because it's at, at the juncture of the Germanic and the Latin worlds, you know, the, the northern and Mediterranean Europe. That's where they meet. Uh, and it's a very different mentality. I had a French and a Flemish speaking uh, parents. So I had really both uh, in, in me. But I live in Thailand. So I live in northern Thailand in a really nice place, uh, Chiang Mai which is 700 meters high. Um, it's a bit of a hub for digital nomads. Before COVID, we were 25,000. I don't know now. There's more. That's all I can say. Uh, you know, there's 35 million digital nomads in the world today and 5 million people with crypto wallets. And quite a few are here. Uh, so it's a town that is, you know, subtropical, uh, laid out in little villages like you know a lot of Asian cities are. You know you have these big boulevards, but then as soon as you're out of them, you're in village life. And so you know I have the birds and the bees and 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 really quiet place uh, to live. Um, I have a Thai wife. Sorry that I give the details, but you know I give some color to to the life. Uh, her mother who lives in the same house has eleven brothers and sisters with three or four children. And they all have one or two children. So imagine, you know, this kind of extended family, tribal dynamics. And so I'm I'm so lucky to live in these different worlds. So I live in a world where, you know, my wife appreciates the monarchy and, and Buddhist religion and family life and is extraordinarily, you know, committed to family and children and, and, and me, <laughs> which is good as well. <laughs> Um, you know, coupled with like, you know, being in the modern world, but also like being at the bleeding edge uh, of technology, not as a technologist, but as an observer of technology. Just very briefly, I work as a contractor for the Civilization Research Institute with Daniel Schmachtenberger and for a uh, Chinese language crypto nomadic network. So these are Chinese language people working with crypto, which is illegal in China. And so, you know, they, they work around, uh, they, they make workarounds. And so this is not just mainland, it's the people from Taiwan and Hong Kong and Singapore and US, uh, but they, they all have the Chinese language in common. And, you know, they're very young. My, my Lee is always 21 years old. So, so, you know, that's that's an interesting place to be, really. Like, you know, European in Asia at the moment where Asia is, like, exploding. Uh, it's a really interesting to, and to place to be. And, of course, the Internet and the cosmopolitan nature of Chiang Mai, which has fantastic second-hand bookshops, uh, makes it a, a really interesting hub. And just, so I, I think that's probably enough about that. Me, but just to give you a bit of a flavor... Oh, that, well, Mr. Bones, it sounds like you found uh, I Iona that uh, Karatani is talking about versus Athens. Oh, I, oh yeah, this is Ionia. Yeah. Oh, this is Ionia. That's a very good point. 
Uh, it sounds, we'll come back to that. We'll come I back was to that. yes, because I was really taken by those parts of the books, and I just the very idea that so much of our notions of democracy is based on Athens, our emotions of thinking, and how no being able to have movement, no um, no being a nomad is a huge part of equality versus having right. to have equality by law. The notion of equality by the ability to move versus equality by law was remarkable. Uh, but before I get into that, because I, it sounds like I, I need to get over there. There's but if I were to ask you, of all the books in the world, this book is on the list of foundational texts. Why is that? Why, why this book in particular, my friend? I, you know, I, it's, I, it's not like, you know, I don't want to make a claim that I'm like at the same level of Karatani, but actually I made the same move as he did. Mm. So peer-to-peer -peer understanding is based on, on, the, on Mosaic change. Of course, I, I didn't use those words, but for me, the I have to say, before Karatani came somebody else, who is Alan Page Fisk, and he wrote a really big, boring book because you know it's very technical and describes all these examples endlessly, and and so he had developed a relational grammar, and he distinguishes four relational grammars. One is communal shareholder. So that's exchanging with the whole. So, you know, you're a hunter, a hunter in a hunter-gathering uh, tribe. You come back with your, you know, your, your band of men and you have the hunt. Like, you're not selling it. You're not even exchanging it. You are sharing it with your family. And there might be some rules, like who gets what first. You know, in some tribes, the hunter is the last one to get to eat because he has the honor and you know that he got from the from the hunt so he doesn't you know in terms of balance but anyway so communal shareholding is when you give something to a group because you benefit from the group so my wife's family in my view is a commons because if i if i help x you know x will appreciate my help but when I need help, it might not be X who help me, but Y. And why is that? Because we're in the same family. The family is the unit. Not it's not a, so this is important. It's not a gift economy, right? Communal shareholding is exchanging with a with a with a with a whole. So example, you know, in medieval times we had agricultural commons. So the people in the village would collectively manage, you know, the forests next to their village and say, well, you know, you can only go for the nuts in March and for the apples in May. So collective rules to preserve the whole thing, which belonged to the whole community and was managed to the whole community. So that's communal shareholding. But today, free software, you know, you write a piece of code that you put in a common pool Nobody owes you anything individual. But why why are you doing it? Because if you improve that software, it's good for everyone, including you. Right? So that's okay. That's communal shareholding. Next is what he calls a, a equality matching. And this is the other name for the gift account. Right? Okay. So this is why is this important? Because you, you'll see how Karatani comes in, but a gift economy is I give you something, Daniel, and you feel gratitude and you want to give me something back, right? Or, I mean, there's some rules and in some islands it's like circle. But anyway, thing is that the gift is, uh, it's not the same as the common because you're giving it to someone. And that, and by doing that, this is the paradox, you created inequality. Right, so now you feel I have to give something back, and that creates social relationship. Now, how are these two related? And I think this is where Karatani really comes in. You know, it's an evolutionary logic. So, you live in small bands. You're not going to exchange. You're all together in the same boat. It's a whole. Now, once you start settling, and you have villages. Well, if you have a conflict, you can't just move away like a nomad. You have to make peace, right? Otherwise, it's war. 
So what you do is you pacify the other village through gifting, and then the other village gives you back, and that creates a social dynamic. So that's another mode of exchange. And and, and so the way I see it, and I and, and I think that's where Caritana comes in, is, is it historicizes this dynamic, right? Alan Page Fisk just looks at like, how do you call it, synchronicity at the same time. So we, we have these four things and what and he tries to know what is what. But Caritani looks at like what is the dominant mode of exchange at a particular time in the history of humanity. So let me just kind of finish the, the logic here because I think it's useful for people to know about this and, and most people don't. So the third mode is called authority ranking. Authority ranking is, you know, let's say I'm a nomad and there's a drought. I cannot survive. And next door is already like a more civilized, civilized uh, city and, and farmers. Well, I'm going to go there, you know, and, and get the, the riches of civilization. Now, once I invade you, like, we are not in a gift relationship. I'm sorry, you know, like there's domination now, right? But no domination can happen only based on power alone. So to rent authority ranking means an exchange of protection against taxes, basically. And you know, and this is this is justified. So look at uh, ninth century Europe. Um, you know, the Vikings coming from the north, the the Moors coming from the south. The, you know, the Muslim invaders, 80, 80 kilometers south of Paris. The Avars come from the east. You know, Charlemagne's Charlemagne's. Uh, uh, monarchy is collapsing. So what do you do? Well, you're very happy. There's a few strong young men, you know, and they say, well, we'll form a militia and we'll defend you. But we need to train. We can't work the land. You need to feed us. Right? So that's, that's feudalism. And that's the logic of authority ranking. And basically, you're born in a certain station of life. And, you know, farming gets this, the craft work gets this, uh, merchants get that, the warriors get this, you know, and and so, and today, you know, your PhD, you earn more than if you don't have a PhD, right? So authority ranking. The, and the fourth is market pricing. I, I, I won't, don't have to detail that because that's what we live in. But so notice how you have those four and then Caritani uh, looks at the historical evolution of those forms, seeing that at any time, they all exist, but they exist in different, with different weights attached to it. And so where that is more interesting than Marxism in a way is, think about a mafia boss, right? Like a mafia boss can be very violent. You know, he's living in a very competitive, violent environment. It's, it's you or it's me, like one of us has to dominate. But with his family, he can be a great family man. You know, that's often said about mafia people. Yeah. They're they're great within their internal community. They help people out. You know, I went to the favelas in, in Brazil. And, you know, if somebody steals something, you go to the mafia boss and he will punish the local thief because you don't steal from your own. Right? But so So they have not just, you know, violent dynamics. They also have solidarity. They might have know, create relationship with their family and be nice to their kids. Why? Because they are in different modes of exchange. When you're with a family, you're in a commons. You give to you give to the commonality of the family. You don't sell uh, in your family, right? Then when when you sell something, you're in a capitalism. But when you're doing the mafia stuff, you're in power. You you're doing authority ranking. So one person can change the psychology. And, and so this, again, this is where Kuritani comes in and illuminates certain things that Marx cannot do, right? Um, yeah, so I, I, I think that, that, so that's like, so Alan Page Fisk is like before, but has a static view. And then Kuritani for me was so illuminating because he introduced the historical dynamic of these modes. I have one critique though, which is, so Caritana uses mode A, B, C, and D. And I think mode A, he confuses both, mm. in my view. He doesn't distinguish communal sharing and gift economy. 
he, he puts that in one bag. I think maybe maybe you read that differently, but that's that's something that I noticed. That's a very interesting insight. I really like that. I think you're correct. I, I like it because I do think there's a difference following Fritz. Well, a few things come to mind. Uh, so first off, that was magnificent. Second, I was really taken by the historic movement as well. Um, and I think it right. it's really important like where he talks about, we have to think about the capital nation state. And if you think about just labor and you don't think about how the state, which has a lot to do with the, the exchange is also part of the base, that it is not the superstructure. So in Marxist thought, there's the idea that the state and the nation are, are more of the superstructure, which is if you change the right. means of production, that will dissolve the superstructure. It will just kind of go away. And uh, right. Coritani at one point says, basically, the state is like philosophy or art or something. It just kind of goes away if you change the means right. of production. But what he really wants to show is that um, you the, uh, it's, it's all part of the base because exchange labor, they all work together. The means of exchange and the means of production are not the same, but they're also inseparable. And one of the ways, like just looking at the beginning of Marx, because, um, you know, Dave and Nance have been doing this wonderful series on the Capitol and, and reading through, I've been very taken by, um, I sometimes think the ways that we come to debate uh, philosophers get in the way of understanding their 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 work. So we talk about the value form theory and the labor form theory. Well, obviously, the, you know, the way that Marx keeps talking about labor is how we quantify value or it's how Chris, what crystallizes value. But I think the word quantify is really, really important. Because the way that we come to determine the value of something and to make it quantifiable is relative to our notion of how much labor went into it. But there's also this funny thing where if I work to make something that I can't exchange with someone, then it has use value and it's not a commodity. In order to become a commodity, right. it has to be exchangeable. But this means the word, here's the key. The whole reason I'm trying to determine its value according to labor is in order to do what with it? exchange it. I'm using labor as a means of quantification for the sake of exchangeability. Otherwise, it's just work, as I like to put it, and I'm going to use it. Like It's kind of like the idea that if I make something that's useful to me, I'm not going to exchange it. I'm going to use it, right? Like labor is defined from work precisely that I am uh, putting my labor into something that has no immediate use value. The use value is the exchange value. It has use because it is exchangeable to me, right? Well, right there, right, this, right. you that's, know, this, that's capitalism to you, yeah. Exactly, that's and to the me, the, you know, and, and the, big mis the big problem, in my opinion, with some of the value, and it depends on who you ask because the other problem is everyone means different things when they use terms like value yeah, form yeah. and labor theory. But the problem is because of that debate, I think it has contributed to what um, Karatani is focusing on, which is an overlooking of the means of exchange as being incredibly historically relevant. Because the entire reason we are quantifying value according to labor is precisely to determine how it can be exchanged and its coordination with exchangeability. Yeah. And so when we take that all very seriously, oh, well, then we really ought to think about how we're exchanging with one another. And to me, too, the, the big thing that Karatani is pointing at, OK, I see, you know, we we change the means of production. We do all of that. But the system of exchange that's part of the base is still in place. Well, guess what? The means of production are probably going to come back or it's going to it's going to lead to a lot of unintentional consequences because you're not realizing yeah. that there's a whole um, that there's a whole picture that has to be adjusted um, together. And I think by talking and I'll give it back to you for for thoughts like for me, the big thing that you get out of Karatani, if we're talking about any sort of new economic model. Well, you better also be talking about a new social model as well. If you're going to be talking about new production, you better also be talking about new means of exchange. So, so can I say a few things about it? So, so one of the reasons you should read Caratani is because he's integrity, right? And, and in different ways. So one, one of the things is that it's a, an incredible synthesis of anthropology, history, you know, political economy, like in order to write a book like he did, you have to read like an enormous amount of literature, you know, which nobody has the time for. And so that's, you know, just in terms of synthesis, it's like mind blowing. This is one. The thing, the second thing is, you know, when you say, when you say capital state nation, it's an integrative thing, right? It's, 
it's not one or the other. It's the power of capitalism is that it's three in one. You know, it's like the Trinity, right? It's uh, three persons, one God, but it's three, you know, three aspects, three modes of exchange integrated in one particular way. So capital is market pricing, state is authority ranking, and nation is community, is in a way communal shareholding or the gift, right, in this sense. And it's because they're all three together, tightly integrated, that you can't easily get rid of it because you attack one, you get one of the others that attack you. So, you know, like you get uh, a crisis and you want to attack the market. Well, hey, oh, fascism is coming. You know, these perverted community dynamics are there to defend capital, right? And, or the state does it. So it's so this is the second uh, integrative part of, of Co Cochin's uh, work. Then the third one I also see is that so, you know, I've been reading a lot of macro historians since 2020, you know, very systematically. I've read Spengler and Toynbee and Quigley, and you know, I'm going to Sorokin uh, uh, after this. And, you know, it seemed to me that you have historical materialism, you know, which is the Marxist thing, you know, looking at the base as a determining. But most of the authors that I'm reading uh, that react to Spengler, which is, you know, the first, uh, it was a cultural historian in my view right? The decline of the West. They're culturalists. So they are historical idealists, right? So you could say that there is historical materialism, but there's also historical idealism because the way they see it, these ideas are primary and then influence. And I think uh, Caritani offers you an integral view. It's not one or the other. You know, they're all interacting and it doesn't mean you have to reject historical materialism or even historical idealism. You know, so the, the way to look at it integratively is saying, well, let's look at historical materialism to eliminate the causal factors around materiality. But then let's not forget to read and understand the historical idealist to understand the agency of ideas and people having ideas and these ideas having an influence on how society is going to be organized and what modes of exchange are being chosen, right? And it's this dialectic between the two, for example, you know, there's a lot of work now around what's called new feminism. And so the current fem feminism, you know, very neoliberal, it's all about equality, you know, doing, doing it, being able to do the same thing as men and women and not, not distinguishing between them and all of that, right? That's very linked to a particular form of materiality, which is the invention of all these labor-saving devices. So, you know, machines do the physical hard work. So suddenly, like we're all doing intellectual work, and, and, and it doesn't matter whether you're male or female to do that. So all the advantages of being a warrior, of, you know, or being doing physical labor that a female could not do and could give you certain advantages tend to disappear. Now, if that changes again, and that's what these new feminists are saying, you know, like we're moving from an age of abundance to an age of uh, limits and scarcity, uh, then you 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 need to go back to partnership, right? So so this is a just an example of how material conditions, you know, impact the way you can think about certain things. But then, of course, you cannot deny that thinking itself. You know, so let's say the materiality of industrialism. Well, you can do the fascist way, you can do the democratic way, you can do the communist way, right? So, and that was a choice with the same materiality, right? Now, once you choose it, like you, your tendency takes power, then they will organize the world in a different way because of their ideas. Anyway, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, it's this kind of interplay that that is that you can see in Karatani more than in, in many other authors.
Um, I think that's outstanding. Um, first off, I really like the phrase historic um, idealism. Not heard that one. That's great to go with historic materialism. Really nice. Um, I think also what, what you're getting at as well, like he has that part where he talks about, like, it's only with the invention of writing that you can imagine the Chinese having this theory of bureaucracy, you know, to have all of the different laws and different things. So you have a technology that allows a new structure of the state. Well, someone had to come up with the idea with that technology. And then, of course, if we follow like a William right. Long, you know, the invention of the scientific treatise requires writing because writing changes how you think and makes you be able to remember yes. long trains of thought. But then the pen isn't doing the uh, writing of the Principica for you, right? So there is this going back and forth, back and forth with one another. And yes. I think that's, in my opinion, another reason I almost want to talk about the situational theory of value versus the value form or the labor theory form. Obviously, there's truth to both, but there's a whole Leibniz situation in which value comes out, right? Because the right. entire reason you like, again, you're, you're using labor to quantify value precisely because there's a system of exchange. And if you don't realize ideas matter, that's to me to emphasize exchange is to emphasize on the idea side. Now, of course, right. it's not just ideas, but you see, if you ask it, because the issue is, let's say, you um you have the proletariat sees the means of production and there is equal owning, but they still only think according to the means of exchange that is commodities. Well, yes. then you then it's not really going to be much of a change. It's just going to be uh moving around chairs on the Titanic, right? Well, exactly, exactly. Can, can I say something because this is so important and also to illustrate my own approach around the commons, right? So, I see the struggle between left and right as understood after 1789. This is a struggle within industrial society. They use the same categories. They just want to arrange it differently, right? So in, in, in this way, you know, like the Soviet Union, you could say that was a state capitalist society. So there's still capital, but they organize it collectively instead of you know individual property. But it's still capital. And they still have workers working in factories producing commodities and the communities are, are still sold for money. Um, so you, you, so now the commons is different, you know, so I talk about the contributive dynamics uh, in commons oriented economics, right? So, so let, let's put the capitalist first. So you, you, I'm a, I'm a worker, I sell my labor or labor time and I produce a thing and that thing is going to be sold on the market at a profit. Now the state comes in and taxes that profit and can redistribute that profit. That's how you have a welfare state. This is not how the commons work. Communal shareholding is, you know, I add code or knowledge or design in a common pool. And the common pool depends on our contributions, which may be paid or unpaid. I can be a volunteer. I don't have to be a commodity worker. You know, because I, it's in my interest to improve the software as a student, as an employed, as a retired, um, whatever. I'm contributing to this common pool. We are all codependent on this common pool. We are commoning around this common pool. But then in our society, we are not rewarded for it. So then we need to add market around the contributory dynamics. But that's already different, right? So now we have a market that depends on the commons instead of a market that destroys the commons. And, and the contribution is, is the condition for the market. You see this? So, so this is when I talk about commons-based peer production, uh, which is a term that came from Yochai Benko originally. That's what we you know. We're saying this is different. Like the modes of exchange are arranged in an entirely different way, the value form is different. The contribution is the key and the market is the rid So we still have all the, the four modes of exchange, but the, the uh, relation of priority and dominance has changed from being market-centric to common-centric. There's still market, there's still like management of territory like the state, but they, the 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 furniture has been re rearranged in a fundamental way, so that our ways of thinking and feeling about value are no longer the same.
this is what Karatanim, uh, you know, calls mod D, but okay, so let's go. To no, no yeah. every day, outstanding. And let me ask you, a, like, you know, a question that comes to mind. So he obviously talks about the capital nation state. Is there a way in which it is to, what you are describing is to talk about almost the commons, uh, almost the, uh, the, the commons capital nation state? But the commons is an interesting thing to add because it's almost like by adding that it changes the quality of the other three. So it kind of talks about like a Bermudian knot or kind of triplex. And the way I think about that is that the commons is a kind of space, and I'd be curious how you respond to that because we mentioned the value form. It is a space in which there's almost value form optionality, maybe competition, the ability to imagine different value forms. And since there's the possibility of imagining different value forms, there are different qualities to the triplex that Karatani describes. Please. Yes. So, yeah, exactly. So let, let me uh, you know, start with a simple phrase. There would be no capitalism without capitalists. Right? So here, here's the thing. So you have, you know, like a medieval city and you have the guild workers, you have the merchants. And what happens particularly in Europe at the time, right? You have a very distributed system. Uh, the empire doesn't function. I mean, you have a Holy Roman Empire in Germany, but, you know, it's, it, it's an elected monarch. Like, this is not an empire. I mean, you know, somebody said it's neither Holy nor Roman nor an empire, right? So it was called that way because they were nostalgic and wanted to recreate, but it was not an empire in the way we understand it. And so th this created particular conditions that allowed the merchant class to become independent in a way that it never could in any other system. Like in the, you know, in the Asian way, you know, the, the Mandarin class dominates, right? With the, with the, around the emperor. And they keep the market small, it's under. And, you know, there is a Chinese formula, which, you know, there's like four words, which is pretty much the, you know, the four modes of exchange. And the merchants are at the bottom of the social ladder. Same in in, uh, in Japan, in, in Tokugawa, Tokugawa, Japan, 16th, 19th century, the samurai are at the top because they defend everyone. You can't live without them, right? Then you have the farmers on number two, because they make the food and you can't live without food. But they couldn't produce if they weren't protected by the samurai. Then you have the craft workers, right? Who eat. And then there's enough surplus in the land that they can work on things. And then only because they work on things can the, the merchants, you know, trade these things that are made, right? So in this in this social order, the merchants are at the bottom. This is the historical reality before capitalism, which meant that the merchants emerged out of their mode of exchange, created a certain mentality, imaginary, that they then want the world to be like them. And this is how they created gradually capitalism and then created a form of community and a form of state that matched their you know their needs as a class and it became the overall system dominated by that class and their ideology this is exactly how i see it about the commons i see people who are commoning have an entirely different relationship with each other because of this commoning you know a contributory dynamic and therefore try to make the world into their image right and so now, because of the digital, makes sharing more competitive than not sharing, right? You have more knowledge, more science, more technology if you work together, uh, you know, transcending the separate entities and becoming codependent on a shared knowledge base. You're, you're more competitive than a capitalist company, right? And so the commoners, and you know, this is what my work is about, is, is making people aware of that. The commoners are creating a world to their image. So let, let me put that in another way, if, if you don't mind, right? So because you talked about writing. So you have for, you know, 100,000 of years, a clan kinship-based economy with gifting and commoning as the core. Then for some reasons, you know, Agriculture becomes more productive, creates a surplus, and that 
and then writing is invented. The class of writing, which is like one or two percent, maximum ten percent of the population, create a world through their image. Market state, the market state, you know, uh, thing, right? Now we have coders. Coders create crypto based on the commons co on community on open source, and they want to extend, you know, th their value system, right? Anyway, so that's the way I, I see things. I, I see things that that you know. So the the class struggle of Marx is not. It's not just about taking over. No, no, no. This is about creating. You're creating. You know all these social relationships that derive from the mode of exchange, from the feeling you have when you common, the value system when you common. Is it's all about contribution, appreciating people because they contribute, not because they're rich or they sell stuff. That doesn't give you prestige in the commons itself. No, but you created the commons, like Linus Torvald, or you know, wow, you know, uh, look at Vitalik Buterin and his prestige uh, in the crypto community, right? Because he is the he is the uber contributor. He made it possible for everybody else to contribute to this common system. Hmm. Now, you know, they, they may market after. They may sell some stuff. But the selling is already derivative of the fact that they have a commons. This is, and so then, then my work is about saying, well, what if, and I think there's good reasons to, to, to think that, what if this is the new thing? So the new thing, still have markets, still have states, you know, it has the four exchange systems, but they rearrange around the commons. And the reason they need to do that is because markets and states are extracted. They do not work within limits, planetary boundaries and social boundaries. And so in a time of scarcity and overgrowth, we need to put the regenerative, protective institution and exchange modality at the center, not not everything, but at the center. So it's not communism; it's common centricity. You know, it's a plural commonwealth, but it has the contrib the contributive commons is at the core of practice and mentality and value uh, value elaborations. Everything you said was magnificent. I really appreciated um, all of that. Um, so a few things come to mind. Um, one of the things that I think I, I really like what you were saying on the emphasis on the imagination and the ability to think ideas and also the notion that writing was a minority of people and, eh, you know, had a pretty big influence. And we really have right. to get out of this mentality that if only a few people think an idea that the idea can't have a big impact. Because honestly, once an idea is thought, it is now possible to be thought. Uh, and I like that right. phrase that you need capitalists for capitalism, because that means you need a kind of way of experiencing reality so that then a system is created of which manifest crystallizes deposits that horizon, which are terms that keep coming up at the beginning all the time of the capital. You right. you have to create a system, but the but the system comes into existence by the ideas that are then deposited and manifest in the system back and forth, back and forth. And one of the, I really do think a kind of, I don't know if it's a tragedy, but uh, a real problem that is missed at the beginning of, of the capital is this, is kind of the question of, how do you even make the idea of a commodity intelligible to people? Like, what are the conditions that even make them imagine that this thing exists that you can exchange? Like, it's a slow buildup. And I really think, you know, I guess um, I'm, I'm not actually sure if this is true, but I think the whole word sociology is invented in the 1830s. I know like in that period, Marx is writing sociology is not a robust separate category. He's definitely doing sociology in the classical sense of what makes something like what are the social conditions that make something intelligible? Because in order for capitalism to work, you have to create an abstract idea kind of magically where you say, hey, everyone, this book here is somehow worth three of these. 
that makes no sense because this is a mouse. <laughs> this is the book. What are you talking about, John? Well, no, listen, there's this value thing that if you have a certain quantification and magnitude, they're exchangeable with one another. This is almost a magic trick to make people believe this. And a certain social condition was needed to make it seem plausible, a kind of plausibility structure, as Peter Berger would talk about. And then you needed authority, the state, to give a sort of check mark. Yes, that is, in fact, a valid mode of imagination. And so, and then I'll give it to you. So Marx starts off with this question of an imaginative transformation that occurs in people that if it does not occur, commodity is impossible. And so we have to see that exactly. as necessary. Yes. So this is the new book coming out in 2025 by Coach and Karatani. But he says, spirit is the, is the power that moves people. Right? So in the gift economy, you have mana or how. And this has been described by you know, the early anthropologists of the 20th century, Marcel Mauss, Karl Polanyi. You know, they studied these uh, gift exchange societies, right? And the people in those societies believe there is a spirit of, of gift that compels them to give, right? They, they feel compelled to give. Nobody tells them to give, like, but it's, it imbues their, their worldview and they think it's the right thing to do because, you know, that pleases that particular spirit, right? And, and Marx, the fetish is the same thing for commodities. We, you know, we, I can't remember his phrase, but like we, you know, we imagine the relations between people to be the relations between things, right? So we objectify a commodity and say it's worth $20, like, Really? Well, you know, how did that come about? So, yeah, the, the, so there's a projection, you know, to, to the social field, right? That, that, and, and so that's, an, I, you know, I haven't read it. It's, it's, it's not available yet. It's, uh, but he, he wrote some articles recently uh, about it. And I, I'm, I can't wait for that, for that uh, new book from him. Uh, because, you know, I, that's where spirituality comes in. You know that the, it's real. You know that's his, that's where historical idealism comes in, if you like, right? They, there's a real spirit. Um, you know, there's an intersubjective field that in which we operate, and that is real. It has real effects. You know, it's like when you come in a room and you have a good facilitator. Suddenly, there is a magical change in the group. Where does that come from? You know, it's it's not in the in, it's not inside the individual. It's really, and it, so it's not the individual. It's not purely the relation between individuals. It's the field in which we operate, which has some kind of thing, you know, whatever that is. That is spirit, and that is that is real. And you know, I I was reading about how you know ancient people experienced this. You know, like. So we have animism, right? And then we have like some kind of concentration of power in these gods and goddesses, right? And I think it's Jonathan, Jonathan Pajot explains this. is because when people get angry, right? They could see that, oh, the anger moves from one person to the other. You know, so it's a spirit out there that is moving people to anger. They had a different vision of the causality of these emotions. And so they could then personify you know, the god of anger, the god, the goddess of love, because they saw this as an intersubjective reality, not as a, you know, and they they may have been much more right than we are by assuming that all these things are just like somewhere, you know, created in our little body mind, you know, enclosed body mind. No, 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 no. These are, these are things that are like flowing, right? A hundred percent. That's beautifully put. Well, uh, the 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 idea of exchangeability or exchange va or value has causal impact on reality. The idea that you can convince people that this is worth five of these has a causal impact on what people do. But but there is no equal sign like that in right. the materiality. 
But what Marx no. describes is this weird move where an idea, I'll call it the equal sign for exchange, you know, the idea of the equal sign, there's no equal sign in nature, by the way, no two things are the same, or else they would be the same. Uh, there's only similarity, right? It's a kind of a Leibniz point right. and different things. But I genuinely have to believe that the equal sign has some sort of objective existence, even though that's impossible. How do you maintain right. this paradox? Well, that's why so you it's need... a fiction, right? It's a it's real a fiction. fiction. That's right. It's a real fiction, that kind of yeah. fetish. And the key yeah. is you have to have a sociological condition that makes the paradox plausible. Otherwise, it will be felt to be a contradiction. Like to keep yes. a paradox from becoming a contradiction, you need an entire social order that creates plausibility structures where, where you go... Well, if they're doing it and they believe it, then it's a real fiction and thus it has causal impact and so right. on and so forth. And this right. is this is where the key is a, a way, I guess, I think about it is that without a commons, you're going to have, let me use the spirit language, you're going to have a monopoly of spirit. There's only going to be one spirit and you're not going to have a space to imagine other spirits according to which you could have causal impact on ways that things relate because that's what ends up happening like the commons is the kind of you know to, i in my opinion like a commons is a space of imagining different spirits so that you don't end up with a single spirit of the equal sign which then organize the quality of the entire right, um, right. capital yeah, nation that's, state that's where the commons are you know i have more diversity because um you know i often argue with this in, in my own community is that so in, in you know in the commons you have a social object, right? So what, why are you together? Because you love something together and are you co-constructing it? So that's why you're together. You know there's something there, immaterial, you know, shimmering, which is for example creating an alternative operating system from the proprietary Microsoft and Apple, so that we can be free, right? Or crypto, which is also motivated by you know, creating, you know, uh, a, a new type of money that cannot be controlled by the banks and the government, right? So so the social object is what brings this all together in, in co-construction. It's, it's like an imminent transcendence, right? But whereas in the capital nation state, like you, your imaginary is, I'm a Belgian, I live in this nation, and we want to compete with other nations. And for that, we have to be good in trade, right? So you have this kind of like intergeographic uh, imaginary. In in the commons, you know, it has its own forms of competition, right? It's because that's where you have forking, right? It's people disagree on what is the best, you know, way to do a particular thing. And so then the social object splits in two. Uh, and no, no, we have to do it this way. And so then you have a commons that creates that and another commons will create it slightly different. Uh, but that is what binds. So the governance, the property formats, everything is dependent on that social object. Like if you do the Wikipedia, you can make a mistake. But if you write open source to go to the moon, you can't make a mistake. Right? Because the rocket will explode. So you have different rules different expectations, different quality concerns, depending on what that's... But that social object is immaterial. Like, when you start doing it, it doesn't exist yet. You know, this is not Caritani necessarily, but it's you know, it's the passion, right? So, in the commodity economy, I have to sell my labor. Hopefully, I get a job that I like. Hopefully, but most of them, I, 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 I do not. And then somebody commands my work in exchange for the money I get. Right. So it's like a, a temporary slavery in a way, right? I give away my rights to be in a feudal relationship in a in a in a, in a company. But in the commons, it's I am doing this because I want this thing to happen. So I, I engage my passion first. Then we still in this type of society we have today, we still need to think about well, how do I make a living from this? And so then we make a compromise. But the market we create has to be compatible with our commons, right? So we need 
generative markets, commons friendly markets, not commons enclosing and commons extracting markets. So even, even though we still have markets, our social imagination about a market is already different. It has to be a market that doesn't destroy our passion and our commons. I'm not saying that was happening all the time because a lot of commons are enclosed and dominated by, and this is the, so this is the, the class struggle today, right? It's not working class and capital class fighting it out for the distribution of the surplus. That is not what is happening in the commons. It's commoners codependent on their commons fighting to have state forms and market forms that are compatible with their social object. Brilliantly put. Uh, you said a lot that was just complete fire. Um, so first off, basically, <laughs> there's a lot of talk about diversity. I love talking to you. This is very rewarding. <laughs> I've enjoyed this immensely because it's getting yeah. at the heart of so much. So a lot of people think you have diversity, um, but it's all basically expressions of the logic of capital, if you will. It's all right. diversity of the same metaphysic, the same system of value. So it's not you really the only true diversity has to be a diversity of spirit of social imagination. If that's not the diversity we're talking about, then it's actually expressions of the same thing. It's not very diverse at all. And, but, the, right. but the problem is that without a commons, it's almost like you stop realizing the possibility for other social imaginations because you get in habits according to the capital nation state. Habits kind of determine how you think, how your character forms, what you like to do. And so by no direct force, just the gradual slow process of the everyday, you get into habits that cannot think beyond the horizon of the social imagination yeah, yeah. presented with. So so this is what happens. You know, do you remember like the collaborative economy that we talked about like yes. 10 years ago, you know, the sharing economy? Like think about car sharing. Right? The, the way a commoner thinks about car sharing is, oh, let's share cars so we use, you know, we need less money to do this. We, we, we do less environmental damage. You know, 10 cars can do 100 cars and we still have the same capacity to go where we want. And then we create a trustworthy community like an association or a co-op to do this. But then uh, I think it was Hertz or whatever company took over one of these car sharing projects. And the language they use was short-term rental. That's it. For them, it was just rental of time of a car. It was a, it became immediately a commodity in their imagination. They could not see it any other way, right? And this is this is what yeah, why imagination is important. We and you know the kind of why ideology is important. It's like making people see the world differently then suddenly, oh, we can do the car sharing in a different way, you know, honoring community and contribution and, and like it doesn't have to be short that short term commodity rental, you know, anonymous, uh, just about the money exchange. You don't know the other person. No, no, we can do this differently. But that requires and now and of course here where the material conditions play that and this is you know this is the bet we are making is well the digital changes the rule suddenly it's cheaper to collaborate than to compete and that wasn't the case 15 years ago right so so this is where material conditions do play a role because they they create they change the the condition of the struggle right suddenly like transaction costs communication costs coordination costs go dramatically down and so now you have like 50 companies with five researchers you know fighting to survive and then you have a coalition around the commons and these 50 companies have 2,000 researchers working together right so that's that's the what is interesting in our time is that that you know the potential for change around this paradigm becomes realistic in a way right I'm not, I'm not saying it's one but it's 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 we should you know we should not forget there is hope because without hope we cannot mobilize our energy 
Oh, I completely agree. I completely agree. And, you know, so, uh, you know, another reason why, like, I, I hesitate when people say labor is value versus labor quantifies value is because when you say labor is value, that limits the social imagination. You are saying that value requires labor. Now, some people mean different. Some people want to get rid of the word value. It's too economic for them, blah, 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 blah. The problem is the phenomenological experience of a human being with passion is a value. There is value here, right? You right. could say care or goodness, but all of those words have something to do with a kind of drive that I want this or I desire to see what is in my head be manifest because not all wants are necessarily just the wants of status or uh, dopamine. There is the kind of the kind of want of the beautiful to honor it, right? So it's, it's complicated. But what you see, like Marx kind of just comes out the gate and say, why people want things? Well, who knows? It doesn't really matter. It's all the same. Well, it, it, there's actually a lot there that should be kind of poked on in the same way that, you know, when Keynes, in my opinion, there's a lot of like demand in economics. Demand's just kind of there. Why is it there? Why does it take the form? They talk about creating demand, but very often it's just stimulating demand. Please, please. Yeah, well, I, you know, that's where René Girard comes in, right? Like, why, why do we have capitalism? Because, okay, the, so we became better at agriculture, we had the surplus. And these people who are managing the system were competing with each other in status. So they needed luxury goods. And that's the beginning of the market. Just, you know, you, there's some anthropologists, they show that like, uh, you know, a lot of tribes, they don't, they don't want to trade. Like they didn't, you know, it's gifting and potlash and, and they, they didn't trade. It's, but at some point, the chief detaches, you know, from from the tribe, right? And then he's competing with other kings. Well, well, you know, I need these feathers, uh, you know, and so I can only find these feathers somewhere else. So you need traders, right? So I think mimetic desire and how it is expressed is very important. And of course, in capitalism, it's all about having. But under the commons, it's about co-constructing this thing. That gives me prestige. I'm recognized for my contribution, not because of what I'm having, right? And so what I find so interesting in the in the crypto world is that, so there's a tension between token holders, uh, you know, the cryptocurrency holders, and, you know, that's very oligarchic in crypto, no doubt about it. It's even more concentrated than fiat currency. On the other hand, in order to motivate all these people to work on these common infrastructures, right? You need to honor contribution. And so all these voting systems they're developing are by nature anti-oligarchic, you know, favoring uh, the contributions over the token holders in terms of decision-making power within the productive community. And that's also something I, I feel is so interesting because you know, you know the work by David Graeber, uh, The Dawn of Everything, which is a book I thoroughly reject myself. You know, you know I, we can maybe another time we can talk about this. I, I don't like this book. I, I think it's totally misleading. It's it's counterproductive. And it, it leads the left astray, you know, like, okay, but we'll, we'll talk about it another day. But one of the things, uh, well, I, I, no, I wanted to say something and I lost my thread in my critique of The Dawn of Everything. I mean, you know, basically what I would say is like the one just thing that comes to mind for me is the extraordinary importance of studying anthropology, like the questions of Gerard and mimetic desire. And I like, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you know, Homo hieroglyptus, you know, by Louis de Mond on the formation of the caste system. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, yes. and, you know, one of the things that because if we don't understand like anthropology can provide hints on how commons could work. Because if we yes. see, like, what do human beings do in a kind of, like, anthropologically, okay, then what are what are humans doing? Um, why do they do these different things? And I think, I think also kind of, and if you regain your thought, please interrupt me. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, the dawn gone, of everything. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> the dawn of everything took it. Uh, you know, it took it away uh, in different yeah. things. And I, and I know we have to go in a little bit. We'll certainly have to do this again. I've, I've enjoyed this immensely. Um, I don't know where the hour goes. It's just like that. Um, but, but there's something about demand. 
Like demand, if we're not talking about just use value, like immediate use value, I want to eat, therefore eat. Demand is fundamentally imaginative. There is something imaginative about it. My state lacks, I want, I imagine get better. So there's an imaginative act that is going on. And one of the things that has hurt economics, in my opinion, is basically not asking, as crazy as this sounds, what is demand? You would think a fundamental concept like demand right. would be asked, but I don't really think it they is at all. They don't care where it comes from. They, you know, economists don't care where it comes. They just assume it as a given. You know, there's a market. So, you know, one of the things I've done, and of course I'm not an economist, but I, I still think it was a useful exercise. So I, I wrote something called Introduction to Commons Economics. And so my point was that under capitalism, you know, we, 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 we state that there's scarcity. Right. And then the market is the way to allocate scarcity. Like that's the fundamental imagination of capitalist economics. Right. Okay. And that's the market. But then capitalism is not just scarcity allocation, it's scarcity engineering. Let's, let's make everything scarce so that we can make it into a market. Right. So capitalism is not just the market, it adds another dimension to it and then reorganizes the world around assumed scarcity and then it's going to do to, to things like terminator seeds right where you design seeds that cannot reproduce themselves so that the farmers have to buy in you know your seeds every year they can just grow and they even make it illegal you know to exchange organic seeds which is like and then you know they make tractors but you can't repair them anymore right so you have yeah so that's capitalism for you, right? It's scarcity engineering. And commons cannot be based on that. Commons has to be based on, well, if something grows naturally, you have to protect that abundance. You know, protect the conditions that make things grow well. You want abundance, right? So it's a, it's a so you, you make a difference between renewable, non-renewable, and you treat them differently. And so our world is topsy-turvy, is where we say infinite things like knowledge, we make them scarce, but then we have this infinite growth economy that assumes the world is infinite. It is not. And you know that's why we have to change. We have to have commons for immaterial things. Uh, you know, because they're outside the market. They, when they're abundant, there's no price. There's no tension between supply and demand. The market doesn't work there. And why make it artificially? So that's why I'm not for NFTs. Because, you know, NFTs are designed to make abundant things scarce artificially. I don't think that's a solution. I think that's really backward. Um, you know, and then scarce things like uh, natural resources, they, they should be treated as scarce. Right, but but not not the in not the other stuff. And so basically, uh, you know, the way I see the common uh, transformation is like a reversal of that logic. And so this is important in terms of like evolutionary theory is that you know the world doesn't evolve smoothly; it evolves through crisis, guilt, transition, and bifurcation, and then there's a mutation. Hmm. So. You know, when you get Christian medievalism, work is good. It's no longer for slaves. It's no longer negative, right? They they have they have done a value revolution. They haven't just like continued the Roman Empire slave system. They have created a new world where working is making the world a better place and you know enhance divine will, right? Because it, it came from the proletariat. It came from the working classes of the Roman Empire, and and for them, value you know, working was value, as opposed to the elites. Like working is what allows us to not work, right? So that that was a value inversion, and I I think the commons, even though it will, you know, reuse some of the old stuff like markets and 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 geographical administration, it will just rearrange it in a fundamental way so that it's true it's a true value revolution and and people's imagination will be different 
And the reason I'm optimistic about it is because it's already happened. We have pioneering communities engaged in peer production, in open source, in crypto, and their imaginations are already already different, right? How do we strengthen this? That's that's the thing. But I think maybe we should wrap up for for. Indeed, for I have enjoyed. I don't know what the time. But I really enjoy speaking with you. Well, I think what you're pointing at that we can continue on next time. Well, first off, the very fact that scarcity is incentivized, the creation of scarcity, and Ivan Illick talks about that. Right there shows you that that labor isn't value. The abstract idea of labor is the quantification of value because scarcity is creating the illusion that it takes a lot of labor to get or that the labor is lacking, but you're actually front, you're creating an impression of an idea of labor by an intentional creation of scarcity. So it's not simply labor, it's impressions of labor. And like, like you see Marx really emphasizing the abstract idea of labor, which then becomes the quantification mechanism. And again, the other issue is if you say labor equals value, well, you really can't have a value revolution. You just have to have different right. forms of labor. Yeah, and you, you, I think we could say that, you know, that the commons world is quality, right? It's quality yeah. oriented. And, and the elite, you know, the elite, the maintainers, the editors, you know, this kind of, so, it's not a command and control system anymore, like in the corporate hierarchy or the state hierarchy. It's a control elite only. So they don't tell people what to do, but they, they defend the integrity of the of the ecosystem, right? And so what they're defending is quality, not quantity. They're defending quality. Like the our operating system has to be good. And so we don't want shitty code or shitty encyclopedic articles. We want and so we will control the quality of the input. Everybody can input, but there is a layer of people validating the input based not on quantity, but on quality, right? This is, this is again, like a, a leap to something different. Well, because, you know, quality, the capitalism is, it's always predefined, right? It's like, oh, let's make a fridge that breaks down in five years and that's quality. Well, not exactly, right? uh it's 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 perverted the I, the very idea of quality is perverted one of the, one of the saddest days was when the uh the washing uh the dishwasher from the 70s was replaced with a new one that thing lasted for like 30 years and uh we yeah. thought it was broke but actually it wasn't it was just the pipe was leaking but it was too late and the new one after four years is like dying dying it's just how these new things work um no i think as a closing part i think talking about quality is very important um for marx the whole idea of a commodity is there's a reductionism down to this abstract principle of exchangeability and that becomes the value so it's reductionist um, to me, a comment is going to be anti-reductionist in maintaining where you don't reduce things down to a quality. And if, and if let's say you need to set a price on something, the comments exist to uh, make sure you um, uh, decompress whatever you compress. Okay, if you need to compress it to a variable to do some sort of quantification, you must never forget to open the zip file back up, right? The problem with com with commodity is that it gets, it gets you into a habit of thinking about everything reductionistly, and then you forget yeah. to um, uh, open the zip file. You reduce it and forget to reopen it. And the, the final point yeah. I'll say, and uh, again, I've really enjoyed this, is what you see is that economics is inseparable from social imagination, which I think is a Charles Taylor phrase. Without a commons, we end up having a single or mono-social imagination without even realizing we have it, which then means it's not a social imagination, it's just the way things are. And once it's just the way things are, you're stuck. You can't think outside the spirit of the capital right. nation. State, and that's that. And so Commons creates a space for the asking of questions of what is the social imagination? What is the spirit without which, yeah, you're captured. Yeah, without which you're Absolutely. stuck in reductionism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. 
Well, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. I, I, uh, yeah, let's do this again. <laughs> yes, sir. We will. Well, thank you.